Om Shanti. <clears throat> well, we can start with a few defining remarks about potential. The Latin root is potentia, meaning power. And so a working definition can be to recognize and activate one's power in order to lead to future success or usefulness. Our power is expressed in all that we think and feel and do. And unfortunately, in our busy, practical lives, we rarely retreat into introspection to discover how better to use our power and how better to expand our potential. So, here we are, wanting to explore how to help others expand their potential. The three most common considerations that prompt folks to expand potential is when they're raising their children, when we or someone we know has a very specific goal that requires newness or greater intensity, and when we hit a problem area of life with ourselves or with others. So I'm thinking that what we might do is take a moment to just reflect so that we'll have something to use um, for some of these principles that we will explore. Take a moment to consider an area where you wish that you could increase your potential. Ideally, something that has uh, left you feeling dissatisfied over a period of time, or it may be a new awareness of something that you would like to change or improve. And then the second thing to note is think of someone you have regular contact with, with whom you would like to help increase their potential. Name what it is that you believe they could cultivate to benefit them or to benefit others. It might be something like willpower or courage or generosity or patience. I'll give you just a moment to reflect. So <clears throat> now that we have an example or two, we can then apply um, some of the thoughts that will be covered to see how it will work in daily life and how you can benefit immediately from being able to experiment with some of the the concepts that we will cover. So a few noteworthy elements regarding the development of potential. Power and potential are self-reinforcing. 
So that means that the more I endeavor to use my power or to expand my potential, um, that the more I identify as being powerful and I become optimistic about reaching my potential. The second is that self-introspection is required for self-directed development of potential. But it can also be cultivated by having others recognize and reflect the person's powers and attributes to them so that they become aware of what is working well for them. And that usually encourages us to do it more. So I thought it would be helpful for me to use an example of a reflection that I recently had um, to offer some of the, the strategies for developing one's own potential. And I think it's important to focus on this first because we really have to experience how we can develop potential before we can help others. And it always, whenever we're trying to serve someone else, we, we have to use our relationship to ourself. Uh, we have to know our experiences in order to imagine someone else's. So recently, a number of weeks ago, I had an opportunity to get a reflection that offered me a window of opportunity. And the reflection was, I'll, I'll kind of try to put it in a nutshell, that I like to be helpful, but I'm also direct and fairly self-assured. And that combination can sometimes have overreach. And, <clears throat> and as I meditated on this, I could sense that in my relationships, there's sometimes a retraction of where people pull back just slightly, mostly with my friends and family, not with my clients, because they're there asking <laughs> for, for, for my input. Um, and I decided that I wanted to literally just kind of hold this experience and think, what could I do to soften that? And it ended up that I just went into imagining all these aspects of softness, because that was the first prompt I had. And things such as tenderness and humility and stepping back to let others have space to be themselves all came to mind. And so I have been on a mission <laughs> to try to soften in my interactions. And it's tricky because when you're in interactions, often um, you're not having an inner dialogue while you're also dialoguing with others. So some of the things that I've done to help me make this change. First, every morning when I have my meditation, I imagine all the ways one can be soft. And I just bask in the feelings and the pictures of the actions, the interactions of just being soft, focusing mostly on the feeling of it and the intention around it. Then 
I make a plan of something specific that I can do that may help. And then I practice it. And in the evening, I don't try and do a global, I'm going to be soft, but I choose something specific. And then I see if I can interject it into my day. Then in the evening, I reflect on how I'm doing. I review. And I think of the times that I've changed a quality in myself. And I picture success. And that picture gives me a belief <laughs> that I'm going to become softer and I'm going to be successful in my aim. So what, if I review it, it's I, I imagine, I feel, I plan, I practice, I review, and I picture success. What doesn't help me? <laughs> I'm not empowered by public or charged criticism. I'm not inspired when told that I'm, I'm wrong or that I'm lacking what it takes. I'm not, I am not helped <laughs> um, when people doubt I will be successful or when I am reminded of times that I have failed or created sorrow or problems for others. <laughs> I'm not uplifted when people gossip and commiserate behind my back and I can feel those vibrations. And I'm not supported when course corrections are prompted by character assassinations or predictions of failure or receiving unsolicited advice. <laughs> and I have to say that I know that I have prob probably done that entire list myself at one time or another, and it's part of some of the internal habits that we are um, we are prompted to adopt in a world that has a great deal of fear, comparison, competition, criticism. And I could, the list could go on. So from that list, we know what we should not do to try and inspire someone to change. And what that does is it creates injury. It creates pain. And what do we do when we are potentially going to be injured or experience pain, even if it's emotional pain. What we do is we put defenses up. And those defenses will shut out any possibility of having an influence on that person. So it is better to not try and help people change if we're going to do it in any of those ways. But there are ways, and one particular way that I'm gonna share that is incredibly potent and powerful. So how do we help people develop potential? The, um, the method I'll be sharing is not my own. My, I haven't developed it, but I have practiced it. And it was developed by a gentleman named Howard Glasser. 
And we have some things in common. He is a therapist um, and a spiritual seeker and worked for many years with children and families, um, with children who had all kinds of very intense difficulties, impulse control problems, anger, defiance, depression and anxiety, which usually follows, low self-esteem, and the list goes on. And <clears throat> as he was, from my memory, his history was that he was building his practice, and so he was willing to take the most difficult cases that other therapists would generally pass, pass on. And he was feeling ineffective and frustrated and began experimenting to find ways to help his clients thrive. And he had also had a very difficult childhood himself, where he experienced a lot of the more coercive end of trying to inspire <laughs> potential. And what he came up with eventually was absolutely brilliant. It's so simple. And when one starts to practice it, what happens, it's shocking because it changes your internal dialogue about yourself as well as your external dialogue about others. You start seeing through rose-colored glasses. You start seeing the beauty and strength and power in every soul, no matter how much they are struggling. So the basic focus or the big one of the, there are three stands to his method and we're not going to go into all three because it's really, the focus is around um, working with challenged children. But what happens or has happened is as he has taught teachers and parents this approach, and he has taught it worldwide, um, there's a lot of um, research that has been done to um, demonstrate the potency of this approach. But the stories are amazing because what happens is the adults that are le learning to do this with children, it ends up changing the way you see things and the way you see people and, and the way you speak. And as that happens, parents were starting to come back to the trainings and say, oh my gosh, I can't believe this. This is so powerful. I, uh, one person shared, um, he used it, he used it, um, he's, he was a um, union negotiator, and he used it with, um, <laughs> with the representative um, in trying to work out a contract that was very contentious, and he started using this approach and everything just unfolded into this, this amazing cooperative conversation. <laughs> um, other, other stories are, uh, well, I think I'll save them until I share, you, share more about the approach, and then you can, you can imagine this. So the approach has um, this ability to unwind damage, unwind the, the, um, the defenses that go up from feedback in the world. And I'm going to, I'm going to actually grab 
the I have a small book, which is such a blessing. I have um, many large volumes on on this work, but this is a very small, tiny little booklet, and it has 13 pages in the back that gives it all in a summary. And there's just a few pages in it that, especially one that can be very helpful. And I have sent that to um, to Anabuti so that that um, link uh, will be available for participants to be able to access. So um, put it in the chat. OK, that will be fine. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> and I think it was sent to Sister Fern. Thanks. Anyway, so um, let me give you some examples. It is basically the whole idea is about recognizing. It is about reflecting and recognizing the power and the qualities within the soul as they happen so that they are irrefutable to the person that is enacting them. So there are some different, there are some different ways to recognize and I will give some examples of them. Use active recognitions to support healthy expression of emotion. Examples. I can see that you are disappointed by my answer. Or you look really sad that Joe picked Carl first. You are being powerful by feeling that feeling and still getting into the game. So of course, these are going to be examples with children, but we can expand it and talk about how we would apply it to adults. The next is called using active recognition to reflect the communicative, communicative intent, intent of a behavior. So another example would be, it looks like you are looking at Johnny because you were thinking about playing with him. Or I see that you are standing close to me and trying to get my attention. You could tap my leg or say, excuse me, and that will let me know you need my help. You are stomping your foot because you don't like my plan. You can tell me I'm disappointed or tell me your idea. The next is experiential recognitions. So this is like a Polaroid camera. What you do is you just take a snapshot of what you see. I just noticed that you helped your sister with her shoelaces. Thinking of her and offering support really shows how thoughtful and helpful you are. You grab the groceries, groceries without being asked. You are sure thinking ahead by knowing I would need help. What a team player. Then there's the use of experiential recognitions. When you played Legos with Joe, you really you were really thinking of him. Playing a game that someone else chooses is really being a, a good friend. I want to let you know that the fact that you took responsibility in a, is a sign of integrity and a quality of greatness I see in you. And then there's proactive recognitions for when you can see someone really getting upset. I can tell you were frustrated that Joey took your toy and you were really powerful by not hitting. Wow, you're sitting in your chair and eating quietly with your fork. You're following the 
dinner time rules. So these are simple recognitions. And they can, they can be valuable just by stating what you see. You don't have to give any qualitative aspects of um, the qualities or powers. It can be powerful just to say, I saw you just pick up that napkin, or I saw, I saw frustration, I saw a deep breath, and then a calm voice, just reflecting. And I can tell you, it sure works on me. <laughs> because in this training, we had to practice with one another. And the trainers were actually using this method with everyone who was sitting in the circle to participate. And it felt a little bit uncomfortable because I wasn't used to it, but it was also, um, it just created a, a tremendous sense of safety and trust and openness to be able to put those defenses down and to be able to receive that someone is seeing me and to absorb that they're seeing something of my, of my, my goodness, something of my power or my values. So that's it. It's so simple. But we start looking for all the things that people are doing right. And when children have difficulty, that they, they can't they can't step out of that immediately but what they can do is it is it could all what we can do is that that it can always be worse and so we can acknowledge the strength in whatever they did or whatever they didn't do you were so angry that you, I mean, here's a child screaming and saying, you are so angry, but you're not throwing what you have in your hand. That shows such restraint. And we can do a lot more examples, but you get the idea. It's looking for what's going right in any situation. If... If someone is cooking dinner and they're overwhelmed in the kitchen and um, they snap at someone and they're bossy and tell them what to do, um, it could be worse, right? They could be taking off their apron and marching out of the kitchen. <laughs> they could be um bursting into tears and and leaving they could be swearing as they're stirring the food there's a lot of things that could not be pleasant <laughs> but if we can acknowledge that person for what they're experiencing so that there's empathy there and then reflect on how they're how they're persevering, how they're communicating their, um, their needs so that they can get support, um, that whatever is going well that we can respond to. And we can also respond by offering support if we recognize that it's needed. So again, all of these things are creating a sense of safety. And in this world, we are operating on fear-based programming. We, we are always 
in a state of wanting to avoid things, not, you know, not wanting to do something wrong, um, not doing, um, not pleasing someone, um, uh, being hard on ourselves. There's, there's many different elements that can be um, dragging us down. And this just literally lifts one up. And, and you can experience almost immediate, immediate resolve. Uh, the techniques that some of the parents had shared that they experienced with adults, one was a, a manager um, in a large company and she had a new hire and the person was <clears throat> a week or two in and was coming in late by 20 or 30 minutes um, every day. And she pulled her into the office and she said, she said, you know, I, I've noticed that you've been coming, coming in 20 or 30 minutes late. And I know that you care about this job. And so I know that you are having to put really intense effort into getting here. And I just wanted to let you know that I appreciate it, that it takes an adjustment and and I appreciate that that you're working on it. And the next morning, the gal came in at 15 after and she acknowledged her and said, my gosh, that's incredible. You, you cut, cut half the time off. It's like, you must be strategizing. You must be really making effort. And within two or three days, the gal was on time. And that would be very different, very, very different than if she had sat down and been, you know, criticized or chastised and threatened <laughs> that she didn't shape up. And, you know, it would have, it would have then put her into a defensive posture. So instead it, it, it broadened, it deepened the relationship and it created a culture of safety within the office. So, <clears throat> um, I have to share this because it, it's a personal experience with this. I've had many because I've, um, I've taught uh, parents um, how to use this with their children and modeled it for them. But I happened to have an experience that was really um, deeply concerning that my uh, teenage grandson, um, my daughter called me and said, I don't know what to do. I feel like this could just go so wrong. He had taken a good sum of cash that had been left on his stepfather's desk and then lied about it when he was asked if he had taken it. And um, my daughter was very upset and she confronted him with it. And, you know, he was like this and no, I didn't do anything. And then she searched his backpack and found it and tears and, and she started questioning him intensely. And he was just going in circles and like making things up as he went. And so she called me and I said, don't talk to him anymore. <laughs> Stop. Right. Let's have a, let's have a conversation. And I, I just used this method through the entire conversation. And it was unbelievable to see, to see his greatness come out. It was really, truly remarkable. It was like magic. He was able to pause himself. He was able to... Um, to slowly recount things accurately. We had a lot of pauses, making it okay for him to need time um, and just recognizing how he felt and, and what we were seeing that he was demonstrating. And 
it literally just unwound all the knots that could have been created. And it ended up creating quite a beautiful situation instead of a situation that could have marked him in the family as being untrustworthy and being a delinquent and very harsh, um, well, damage in the relationship with his stepfather. I could go on and on. And instead, um, he, he had given some of the money to his friends because his fin friends were wealthy and they had been treating him every day after school to Starbucks or um, whatever. <laughs> And so he had, he had actually um, been wanting to give back to them. And so he had been treating them and had spent about $150 of the money over a period of a week. So um, he ended up saying that he, he wanted, he wanted to show that he cared and that he, want, he wanted a good relationship with his stepdad more than anything and had the courage to go in in front of us and speak to his stepdad, own up to all of it. He gave him all of his Christmas money and birthday money that he had saved up. And then he worked the rest of the money off, which took him many, many, many hours of labor on a hillside, cutting down weeds and so forth. I know it's a long story, but it's just, I can't tell you that could have gone in such a different direction. And if I did not have this, it would have. And I've, I've just seen how it's worked with family members and, um, and with adult clients, and it is enriching, it's respectful, it's not intrusive. Um, and the only thing that can happen is sometimes people can feel uncomfortable getting those kinds of reflections. But you just persist. <laughs> and eventually they soften. And start to accept them and start giving them to you in return. It's literally like a culture that starts to, to be built. So when I heard this topic, I just had, had to jump in and say, oh, please, I'd love to share because it, it is, um, it's in keeping with so much of one's values when you truly, truly want people to meet their potential. It's, it's remarkable. So, um, I'm, I think what I want to do is maybe open it up to, to, to see if there's um, if there's any questions, um, if there's anything that you would like to cover um, before we have a bit of meditation. Or we can use... Uh, well, I, I had it. Uh, you can now unmute if you have any comments or insights, questions. This sounds like a lovely book. I don't have the link. It is on Amazon. You can find it. Yes, it it is, and and it's not very expensive. No. And, um, one of the things that I love about it is in the back. It has this wonderful list, and that was one of the pictures I had. But it has this wonderful list of all these um, reflections of. Uh, mm -hmm. a soul's greatness that can be shared because we really in the beginning I mean I considering that the profession I'm in I thought my vocabulary would be okay <laughs> mm -hmm. 
but it has expanded greatly um, in all the nuances of recognizing one's qualities and powers. And that's really what potential is about, right? Mm -hmm. Mm. That, that's what it is, is how can we continue to upgrade and how can we support others in upgrading? And the benefit is reciprocal, which is often the case with benefit, right? When, the, when something is benefit to me, it will benefit the people around me. And when something is, is beneficial for someone else, then it also benefits me. And um, and I have I have found that it has that that reciprocal um, effect in that the more I use it, the more I become it. And that my view and my my view on my on my on my own relationship to myself as well as my view on others. Um, is in a position of empathy and um, appreciation. Mm -hmm. I can't think of a better a better combination. If I if um, if I was going to have to choose a parent, that's the kind of parent I would want. If I had to choose a boss uh, to work for, that's the kind mm -hmm. of boss I would want. Um, to be under the influence of. So maybe what we can do now is um, just take some time to have um, to have a meditation. There's there's so much more. There's so much more we could go into having to do with cultivating um, qualities and powers. Um, I think I'll mention just one other thing, and that is that they're all linked. And all you have to do is start with one. And if someone really absorbs and starts to connect to the quality that they have, it automatically links to other qualities and other powers. So it can't stay isolated because they are they all they all have a reciprocal um relationship if you start with tolerance there's wisdom involved there's generosity there's accuracy there's kindness there's fairness there's there's empathy there's there's all kinds of other elements around tolerance and it starts to light those up and then you start to see those and then it just keeps expanding. Okay. Well, let's see if we can have some meditation now. All right. <clears throat> So just get comfortable for a few moments. Stretch if you need to after sitting. I'm going to take a sip of water. Okay. So we had an earlier experience where we slowly gradually went from our attention on the outer world and our thoughts involving our interactions in the world to moving inside. And we'll take a shortcut and just gently imagine moving into that beautiful, wide open space within the mind. There may be thoughts and images that come in and it's okay. Just allow them 
And keep returning your attention and your concentration on the space, the wide open clear space. And you, the one who is experiencing it. Allowing a feeling of calmness and peace. To slowly roll in In the spirit of softness, we can imagine where do we see softness in the world? The soft feet of a newborn infant so soft and rosy and pink, pure and vulnerable. The softness of clouds floating detached from everything down below. Gently moving to the air currents, no resistance, total surrender. just in a state of allowing and being. Picturing the softness of rose petals. Plump, smooth, fresh, new, unfolding opening sharing their softness their color their fragrance Softness of snow. Gently floating. Almost as if there's a trust that they will land right in the spot they belong in. Melting, dissolving, and moving on 
in the flow of life. The softness of a father's tears, watching his child. Seeing the innocence and the joy of mastering a new experience. the softness of a grandmother's hug, familiar, comforting, feeling valued, the softness of a whisper, being quiet so as not to disturb, sensitive, communicating, Caring. The softness of freshly mowed lawn, green, sweet-smelling grass, offering a carpet of natural fragrance. Supporting Bending, cooling, the softness of sand, embracing. Warming, cooling, padding, giving, taking. Surrendered. Changeable, and the softness of one's heart. How is the heart soft?
caring, giving, compassionate, Appreciating, smiling, affirming, connected. Let me hold all these qualities of softness. And offer them. Giving them freely. and bringing all in connection to their greater potential. And now gently return to your environment. Reorient yourself. And then, if you can, just take another moment and go back. Go back to your meditation and allow whatever touched you deeply, whatever image, whatever quality, whatever the experience was that you want to go back to, just return and breathe it in, feeling it fully, Absorbing it. Remembering it. And now we can finish the meditation. Om Shanti.